we go. What's up, everybody? My name is She Says, and you are watching the Super Mario Odyssey episode of Boundary Break, a show where we basically take the camera anywhere we want, and we try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. I know it's been a while. I think it's been about three years, which, wow, what, what was I doing? Well, the thing is, I know that Mario Odyssey has a lot of expectations, so I wanted to make sure that the camera was up to snuff to make sure that there was a lot of good content for the episode. And at this point, we can now look at stages without any restrictions whatsoever, so I'm very happy about that. And the person that we have to thank for that is Granimated. He's very well known for making tool sets on the Nintendo Switch, and he went for the trouble of making a really good camera for Super Mario Odyssey. So, thank you, sir. Links to all of his things down below. And with that said, let the wait be over. Let us begin Super Mario Odyssey. So the first thing I want to talk about is T-Poses, because I learned a lot about how this game operates by finding T-Poses. And I'm going to reveal my deductive reasoning as we go along here. So with this first image, you can see that all the band members are in a T-Pose, with their instruments sitting at the bottom of their feet. Now that's really interesting, and how I managed to find this was I started up the scenario, and with a little bit of walking around, I activated the camera and took it all the way to the top of the building here to find this. But then I discovered something. The T-poses are based off of how long you've had the map out before you go into camera mode, which freezes the game. So I tried it again, only I tried to do it as fast as I could. And I'd say about maybe four to eight frames managed to squeak through before I was able to push the button. And by doing that, I managed to get the entire crowd here <laughs> to, I guess, be in a T-pose as well. I've never seen so much intimidating dominance in my entire life, but boy is that a treat. Okay. So, whatever is well outside the player's view is loading in the animations for all these character models a little bit later than when you load the map itself. And so I tested this all out to see how many team poses I could possibly find. One of which being that I really wanted to see if I could get a Pauline team pose. But unfortunately, she never gets a team pose, at least not on frame one when you can load this map. And the reason for that is that her model is frozen on the first frame of her animation when she gets called into the cutscene. But if you skip that cutscene as fast as possible, then go into camera mode as fast as possible. She still won't be in the T-pose, a little disappointing, but you will find her in a position she's not supposed to be in. When she first gets loaded into the map, she's not on top of the stage, but instead she's underneath it. And the pose that she's in is frame one of the animation that would play during that cutscene. And the same thing's gonna happen in other maps as well. Taking the camera out on frame one of the Wooded Kingdom can show you a Fire Brother also in a T-pose. But not only that, it shows you all the things that can be attached to the model as well, which we'll talk about in just a second. But for this model, you can see that his hat's still there, but the hair is there too because it's bleeding through the hat. And the Mario mustache that would come into play if Mario was to capture him is also on his face, even though we clearly have not captured him yet. This is because these are all the possible objects that can be attached to this model. And when a animation is not assigned to the model yet, not only do you get a T-pose, you get all the available accessories to the model as well. Which brings us to the Lost Kingdom. Here you go, you got another T-pose for the Koopa. But let's revisit that idea that the character models also share all their accessories in their unloaded model and take it over to the bird here. Now you might remember, and if you don't, I'm going to show you this animation right now, that the bird can squawk in unhinged jaw essentially to have a very exaggerated animation. Well the exaggerated part of its mouth is a separate accessory to the model. And so with the character model unloaded here, you can see both versions of the bird overlapping each other at once. It's very weird looking, right? Well, to top off our T-posing tirade here, I'm going to show you the cream of the crop. A very popular character in the Super Mario franchise, Princess Peach, can be seen in a T-pose as well. Both these character models show you every frame of the eyelid, which makes it look frankly disturbing. You can send your memes here if you have anything good to share. I might retweet you. But not only that, but with Princess Peach, you get a nice T-pose as well. Rounding out to probably the most amount of T-poses I've ever seen on this show, if you count every single character in that crowd there. Another example is Donkey Kong himself. Just like I mentioned before, if you can load the map before the first few frames get out, all the frames of animation for Donkey Kong load all at once, and they all stack on top of each other, fighting for that Z-axis. I ended up posting this to Twitter, and I got some really funny responses, so I'm just gonna list off a few here. YouTuber Arlo says, just as nature intended. Tokenyo says, like those old Game & Watch games where you turn it on and all the parts light up. Gaming Dominari says, he looks like some meat abomination from Resident Evil. Lots of people seem to think he looks like a spider. Like for example, Reagan here. <laughs> Baru says, it looks like he had an allergic reaction to himself. 
But anyways, with that segment out of the way, let's do a zoom out of the Luncheon Kingdom. Okay, let's talk about low poly models. Sometimes in this game there are models that are not affected by level of detail. And to put level of detail into layman's terms, games oftentimes will have like a really, really low poly model way off in the distance. And then when you start to get closer and you're able to have the human eye recognize more details, a more quality version of that model is then replaced. But in Mario Odyssey, there are some things that are always going to be far away. And so they're always low poly. Pretty much anything that has a sail out in the sky is almost always going to stay low poly like the Sphinx here, as well as the cabs off in the distance in New Donk City. In fact, the one that's attached to the sail has a different model from the ones that are on the bridge. So this guy right here has a little bit more detail than the other guys, and taking the camera over to the taxis on the bridge, like I said, can show you that it's even more low poly. Then we got a low poly environment too. Like the Cap Kingdom here, you can see way off in the distance, it shows a very small glimpse of the Cascade Kingdom. Now if we take the camera over there, you can see that this environment is really low poly. It isn't modeled on all sides, which is very, very typical for far off environments. An immediate example that I can show you right here and right now is that in Cap Kingdom, all the buildings that make up the background are also just 2D textures. So for Cascade Kingdom to have any 3D depth whatsoever is actually more effort than they really need to put into. And then there's the human models in New Donk City. Now I was starting to get really disappointed. I thought I wasn't gonna be able to show you guys these low poly models that were very clearly out in the background. But thankfully in this one area, you can see two different types of low poly models for these characters. Some have the jaggy hands and really, really primitive low grade textures to represent the face. Then sometimes you get these guys with slightly higher polygon counts who have claws for hands and no eyes. I find that in particular to be really interesting. You'd think that there would at least be eyeballs so that you can't see the backdrop through their face. <laughs> but I suppose without having eyeballs, you do save a little bit on resources. Put them all together with no joints whatsoever so their arms just turn super duper skinny and stuff. And you have an ensemble of pure terror. And the last low poly model that I want to show you is actually attached to a very, very high poly model. It's a weird hybrid. The dragon atop the ruined kingdom is both. Something I've never seen in my life. The part that you're meant to see is incredibly detailed. I think we all were very impressed by how amazing that dragon looked. And I assumed, as well as probably many of you assumed, that there would be a separate low poly model off in the distance, and the model up close would just not have a lower half body, especially because the environment designers made it in such a way that you can't see below the cloud line. That's a pretty common technique to just hide the fact that there would be nothing to see down there. However, it does turn out that if you take the camera down there, you can see a weird hazy body I guess this is also another failsafe if somehow, some way, you managed to break the camera on your own and was to somehow see his body, but there is a reason why his body is masked in heavy amounts of fog. Because they're using the same body that is used way off in the distance in a scene like this. It's a low poly model. If you were to take the camera up close to its body like you would to its head, you'd see that it's a lot more blotchy and there's a lot less rigidness to it. Obviously, this is to save on resources, allowing the game to run totally smooth. And since we're already in the ruined kingdom, why don't we show you a zoom out of what a ruined kingdom would look like? Like with most large environments, it's just a huge circle. But what's really cool too is that there's mountains that you can't even really see in game. They seem to span pretty far well outside the sky dome itself. But anyways, with that said, yeah, here, take a good look at this entire environment. It's kind of nice because you get to see the dragon in the center there. Whoa, look at that. It's a She Says plush. Wish I could say it exists forever. It's not, unless you buy one. So, as of the time of recording this, there's only nine days left to buy one. I am super duper proud of this product. It is a very legitimate plush. More legitimate than some video game plushes I've had in the past, actually. For example, the hat on this plush is a separate object from the actual plush. And so if you were to remove the hat, you could technically see a full head of hair. And if you DM me on Twitter with a proof of pre-order, the first 28 people that do this, I will either A, invite you to my Animal Crossing town, or B, play you in Super Smash Brothers. It's up to you. 28 people though, I'll let you know if you made the cut. But you know what, either way, it's an awesome plush and I hope you guys enjoy it. Anyways, back to the show. 
Now let's talk about birds. Well, actually, first we should probably talk about these bats. Out of all the 3D birds, these bats seem to be the lowest quality out of the entire game. They don't have any eyes, they don't really have a mouth or anything. It's just a 3D shape uh, that resembles a bat. So I would dub this the least interesting. Now we're not gonna go over every single bird that's in the game because I think there's different birds for every single kingdom. But here in the Metro Kingdom, there are pigeons essentially, clearly trying to remain in line with the New York aesthetic. But what's cool about the pigeons in New Donk City is that the birds that are way off in the distance are 2D textures. And if you were to take the camera behind the 2D texture, it flips upside down for some reason. Another really cool fact about these textures is that there is one frame out of this animation where there's some artifacts left behind by the artist. Then in the Mushroom Kingdom, we have these white birds with these cute little eyes. They're very pudgy and, uh, you know, they got a little tuft on the top of their head, almost like the tip of an ice cream cone. And the rest is fairly easy to see thanks to camera mode, so I'm not gonna focus on this too much. Instead, we're gonna move on here so I can show you some things that you can't see yourself. Everything you're about to see here is unused or at least unseen and used in the game. Starting out with the final battle with Bowser, the background elements seem to be a whole bunch of cubes, but if you were to take the camera outside of those physical 3D cubes, there's a sky dome behind all of that, and that sky dome is never seen by the player. At least not here. It is used in one other place, and it is visible. And that's against this boss here. But now we're going to talk about the mystery of the hexagon. I couldn't find this hexagon object in any other place in Mario Odyssey. The only place I could find it was Seaside Kingdom, and its two locations don't really have any consistency to what's above them. You can find one underneath the Sphinx, and that's just below the staircase, and I did have the Sphinx move just to see if it would move with the Sphinx. That wasn't the case. And then the other one I was able to find was over by this volleyball net, and this hexagon here has a really bright light attached to it, which again, is really odd. And then, unlike any other doorway in the entire game, the doorway for the Toad Ships seemed to have a weird texture at the end of the doorway. Seems to be a metallic arch of some way. It's very strange, totally gives me Rayman vibes, but I don't think it serves any purpose. I think it's just weird artifacts that the artist left behind. Also, I know it's not in the right category, but I do want to mention this one last T-Pose that I found. In New Donk City, there is a resident that is in a T-Pose and even has a Mario mustache. Once again, figuring out all the things that we've learned up to this point, he has the mustache because every single resident should have every accessory available to them. But we all know that not every single resident can be captured by Mario. In fact, it's very rare. And the only ones that ever do get captured by Mario have blonde hair, not black. This was the only resident that I could find that was in a T-pose in the main area. Specifically, this NPC just tells you about the action guide. Over here with Bowser, if you take the camera inside of his shell, you can see that he has a fully modeled back. And this is something that's old news. I actually once did a whole video chronicalizing the entire history of Bowser's unused back. And taking a small clip from that video can show you what it would look like if we removed the shell outright. Why they still do this to this day, I have no idea. And then if we use the coin filter, which allows you to see all the bump mapping in the entire game, you can see an unused texture for the taxis. Only ever seen on the broken down taxis, you can see at one point the license plate was supposed to read 6258-ND, and it was later changed to 1981 a significant year that represents the birth of Donkey Kong. And then there's the recreation of the Mario 1 stage. It was really impressive, I was not expecting it to be honest with you. But the way they pulled off is a little bit tricky. So, first of all, I just want to say that outside the boundaries of the theater room is the whole stage to Mario 1. And then when you start the quote unquote game, the entire stage gets pulled over to the projection screen. And this is still all being pulled off in the Mario Odyssey engine, of course. So there's certain things that are outside the boundaries that you can't see. And these aspects are used to imitate some of the stuff that you see in the original Mario game. Like for example, you cannot walk in this direction, the left. And so what they do to compensate for that is that they added in elements from Mario 1 to make a giant wall. And the underground area is literally underground. It is down below the original area. And all of these elements are hidden by the game's curtain. Also, I want to take this as an opportunity to mention that some of this footage, like the one you're looking at here, was made possible by using Jasper's noclip.website. Most of what we could look at in this game was done with the camera that I mentioned earlier. But in those rare cases, it didn't really quite do the job. Jasper's website managed to get us covered. And as we move on to the next scene, here is a zoom out of the Lake Kingdom. Okay, now it's time to talk about developer techniques. Towards the end of the game, there's this scene here where you can break down a series of walls. 
And because this object is completely unique to itself and is never able to be seen at all angles, if you take the camera behind it, you can see that it's not fully modeled. And because of the way that the cracks are angled, you can still see some of its depth. But that's just the boring stuff. Let's start getting into some of the more interesting developer techniques. Like this one here with the giant crowd that goes through the submap area. Now the way this works is that there is a set number of models here. And every time the model goes through that doorway, the coordinates of that model just gets transported to the opposite end. And this can be proven by showing you the frames just before it hits that target point and showing you exactly which models show up on the opposite end, which is the exact same ones. The biggest anomaly, of course, is this character here. He consistently looks the way he does and he stands in this one place and he's never seen by the player. Now it's hard to determine what purpose he serves if any, but it would be a safe theory to assume that the programming of the warp coordinates is mapped to this character model. Another fun thing to look at is how the waves are pulled off in this submap here. How is the effect pulled off? Well, taking the camera outside the boundaries can show you that it's just one giant object that gets pushed forward. And within the confines of those walls, it gives the illusion of a body of water having a ripple effect. But like I said, it's more like one giant ribbon that's just kind of being shoved through the map. And this was pretty crazy too. All over New Donk City are a whole bunch of unused doorways. Now it seems like all the residential doors seem to have an unused doorway. Pretty surprising, there's nothing available to the player organically that allows you to see the other side of these doors, so really all of this is a bunch of needless geometry. And it's not even consistent, some of the doorways are completely different from others, and the glass office-y kind of doors almost never have a doorway. Except for in rare cases like this one here. And keeping inside of New Donk City, also well outside the boundaries, you can see a really cool interesting idea that the developers put in place. Possibly to save on loading, but if you were to take the camera way, way out into the western part of the map, you can find the concert hall to New Donk City. And yeah, the location for this concert hall is here at all times. Because if you were to go inside the building and then have Mario be there, Taking the camera outside the concert hall will show you that all of New Donk City is still there. It's just that the lighting has been changed. And I also found this to be pretty uncommon, but uh, I found it here in the cathedral. The entire map for the inside of the cathedral is also housed inside of a prism that the player can't see. And then if we take ourselves inside of the Mushroom Kingdom, it's going to be something that's a little underwhelming, but it's still kind of cool to check out. At first it looks like nothing, but in the dead center of the castle, there for some reason appears to be a hole in the water layer. It's really weird, it's a perfect circle and everything, and you can see the rigidness of the waves on the edges of the circle. And like I exampled earlier in the episode, you might notice that most of the time, when things are off in the distance, they end up being 2D textures. Makes sense, easier to produce, much less taxing on resources, player will never reach it to ever find out. So what do you think about this right here? Do you think the Earth is flat? Well, I'm very happy to let you know that that's not the case here. The Earth is an entire sphere. Takes a long time to get over here, so I gotta do a jump cut just to get the camera at a separate angle. But way off in the distance, you can see that there is an effect to kind of give it that outline glow. But from this angle, it's more like a ring. And the planet itself is uncompromisingly massive and fully modeled. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Here's a zoom out of New Donk City at night. And while you're taking a good look at that, I just want to mention once again that there are plushes for sale. Uh, there is a link in the video description as well as probably the pinned comment. It is a limited time only and I will never be doing a plush ever again. So for those of you who have always asked for a plush or if you have an interest now, this will be the only opportunity you really have to grab one. So if you're interested, good luck to you. Anyways, got to give a huge thank you to The Great Beyond, Erwin Rommel, and Steven Olsen for literally keeping the channel alive. If you want to support the show like they have or be one of the $20 patrons in the credits here, there's also a link to my Patreon page in the video description down below. It's helping me out immensely at this point. So guys, thank you so much and I really hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope that you enjoy more episodes in the future. Take care.